Hi guys, George Dahl here. Welcome back to my film journal on what I hope will be an interesting and special episode where I'm speaking today about Starlog Magazine, the premier movie, science fiction, and genre film magazine of the 70s and 80s, though the magazine did run till 2009. You could have found the first issue on your newsstand in 1976, and the first few issues or so were basically cobbled together old information about Star Trek. It was a, primarily a Star Trek fan magazine. That all changed when uh, Star Wars came out in 1977 and changed Hollywood basically forever. And then all of a sudden the magazine had all sorts of things to write about. The Incredible Hulk, Battlestar Galactica, Buck Rogers in the 25th Century, Alien, Outland, Kroll. The fun thing about Starlog Magazine for me is it's a great time capsule to go back and see what it would have been like to be a contemporary fan of genre and science fiction films at that time. The other fun thing about the magazine is that there is no hyperlink. It's not a Wikipedia page. So when I come across a cool article about, say, a movie that never got made, or some kind of interesting science fiction news, there's oftentimes not a lot of follow-up. So I end up going on the internet and doing something I call going down the Starlog rabbit hole. And I've done this a few times, so I thought maybe this video would be an interesting way to talk about some of the things that I've found in my, my studies on the internet, in my excavation of the internet. Because I turned up a lot of little interesting stories. Maybe you've heard some of them, maybe you haven't. But the source of all of them was Starlog Magazine, was an initial article I found there. So without further ado, let's dig right in and start at the letters page, which generally opened the magazine. If you read through issue two, which had a cover about Space 1999, a television series I believe was on NBC for two seasons, there was a person who wrote in, I believe from Arizona, saying, this magazine is my lifeline. And it really would have been. There would have been nowhere else for you to get news about science fiction and fantasy at that time. There was no internet, there were no message boards, so you had Starlog Magazine. And basically this guy goes, I feel like I'm alone in the wilderness. Nobody I know likes reading Arthur C. Clarke novels and uh, learning about space, and he doesn't, they don't care about Plan 9 from Outer Space, the old movies. Or, he goes, this magazine has been huge for me, but what I really want is a pen pal or a fan club or something. And Starlog, in one of the early issues, they published a list of things that are readily accessible to people like us now. I saw someone comment on my YouTube page a little while back saying, hey, um, this is a great video or something like that. Of course it is. And uh, he said, um, I, can't, I wish more kids my age liked movies like this. And I go, well, hey, dude, at least you've got YouTube. You've got, you can reach out to people like me. Um, at least you have Reddit. I mean, back then, you had nothing. You'd have been a total nerd on an island. So Starlog Magazine actually produced a book that I tracked down and bought on eBay, which is called the Starlog Communications Handbook. And basically what's in this is a lot of things that would be absolutely worthless and not worth purchasing in book form now, but back then would have been like, I mean, totally life-changing. And in here you have a list of the, the uh, mailing addresses for all the production studios listed by the television shows that they produce. So if you wanted to send a letter to In Search Of, which was basically like, a show with Leonard Nimoy where he uh, like did investigations in, in, into Bigfoot. Basically, it's the precursor to what the History Channel is now, 24/7. You could uh, you could write to Columbia Pictures Television on 711 Fifth Avenue in New York, New York, and you could make your voice heard. But for me, the most fun part of this little publication is the section on fan clubs. How to join a fan club? So in here we have fan clubs for. You know, Doctor Who, and there's a Doctor Who Appreciation Society in Melrose Avenue in Wimbledon Park, London, and you can become a member. And there's a handy little article at the beginning of this book called Starting a Fan Club, which teaches you how to do it. You got to reach out to the star or to the franchise that you like, let them know what you're going to do, and then send out, like, get the, get the word out about your fan club, right? Collect dues and release basically a cheap, like, publication that you would print off. A lot of these publications that I've found online look a lot like maybe a high school newspaper you know like you know uh, pages folded together with uh, fan drawings and like rudimentary little articles and games and all sorts of weird stuff but there's a whole wiki devoted to all of these fan clubs it's an it's a completely fascinating avenue to spend an afternoon looking at because people have done yeoman's work to preserve a lot of these fan produced quarterly magazines 
For me, though, the one that I thought was the most interesting was under Star Trek. Obviously, you have the uh, uh, Captain Kirk fan club. You've got the Star Trek motion picture for the Gene Roddenberry fan club. And then there's, of course, the International James Doohan Society, which published a quarterly magazine published by two women who apparently just thought James Doohan, Star Trek Scotty, was like an incredibly captivating force in the culture. And you could pay $25 to be a member and you would get your magazine and possibly the chance to get a letter or message answered by James Doohan. So pretty fantastic. But if you're if you're interested, I would I would definitely recommend going down the avenue of fanzines. And Starlog Magazine was basically ground zero, the hub to connect you with whatever you liked. So it provided an invaluable service. So we're going through here, we're stepping through the magazine chronologically, and the first thing you would see when you opened up a new issue after the table of contents was a publisher's letter from Cary O'Quinn. It was called From the Bridge, and every issue he talked about sort of, he set the mood for what the magazine was gonna be about. Early on, they did a lot of magazines that were themed. Sometimes he would talk about the state of science fiction or just a fun anecdote. In the case of this issue, which is sort of the getting you prepped for Return of the Jedi issue, uh, number 74, 1983, uh, we get a really interesting column here where Quinn talks about meeting a fan, a kid named David Packer, who he first met at a science fiction convention and who forced his way into the Starlog magazine offices on the claim that he had a brilliant million dollar idea for how to grow subscribership. The article is called Push Comes to Shove because Quinn basically says, hey, this kid, David Packer, he was incredibly pushy and very like antagonistic. And he would just come at me and come at me and come at me until I basically said, yeah, fine, come to the magazine office, geez. He would not take no for an answer. And the article is sort of an inspirational piece because Packer basically loves science fiction, loves genre films, but he really wanted to be an actor. And he thought that by making any connection at Starlog Magazine, maybe they knew somebody in the industry, he could parlay that into a gig. And Quinn said, hey kid, you got a lot of promise, keep at it. You're not the most handsome guy in the world, but give it your best shot. And basically he did and made it to some extent. He was a recurring guest character on the popular television miniseries V, which is I guess about aliens coming to Earth. I've never seen it, I heard it's like somewhat good. He made a few reoccurring appearances on that show and in the article, Quinn says basically, hey, take this kid, he wouldn't, he wouldn't give up and look where he is now. He is a Hollywood actor. And it's sort of a, you know, a feel good story. And I read that and I thought to myself, well, whatever happened to David Packer? I wonder if this guy did anything else. So I went down the Starlog rabbit hole, looked it up, and it turned out that in addition to his television appearances, the thing that Packer is probably most known for today in history is the fact that he was a witness to the murder of an actress named Dominique Dunn. So Dominique Dunn was actually the sister, little sister, of Griffin Dunn, who you will probably remember from An American Werewolf in London, or uh, Martin Scorsese's After Hours. His... Uh, his sister was good friends with Packer. They were tight and they were both on V together. And they were at her house one night running lines and practicing for the next day's shoot when her sort of possessive and insane boyfriend rolled up in his car and she went out to confront him. And they, had, they started yelling and fighting and Packer wasn't sure whether or not he should disturb this sort of like domestic dispute until he heard screaming. And Dominique Dunn was murdered and strangled to death, killed by her, like t murder, bo killed by her boyfriend. And Packer called the police and he ran and hid in the house and he said, hey, just to let you know, if I die, this is the guy who killed me, Dominic Dunn's boyfriend. Fortunately, the authorities arrived on time, arrested the guy and threw him in jail. Um, but man, I mean, that's, that's quite the uh, welcome to Hollywood, hooray for Hollywood story. Uh, not exactly what I expected to find. Packer made a few small appearances in some forgettable 80s comedies. I think he was on some television shows as a guest but he's retired from acting now. Uncharacteristically, his Wikipedia page is like very, um, it's got a lot of information, maybe more than you know you would feel comfortable having out there about his personal life. But apparently now what he does is he runs a you know telemarketer call center in Ohio or something, um, which I guess ties back into Quinn's assessment of the guy. He was pushy. So if anybody's gonna run a you know call you at 5 p.m. dinner time salesperson phone call office, I guess it might have been him. Let's keep rolling. In the magazine, after you uh, read the opening 
letter, there was a um, basically a news blog, kind of what you would see on any movie blog today, which is like, it was called Log Entries. And it was basically just news about, hey, this show's getting renewed for a third season, or this movie is coming out, or the director of Star Trek II is going to be, uh, what's his name, 7% Solution, Nicholas Meyer. There was a fun one that I found in here, and it basically talks about how, hey, if you call this number, 1-800-521-1980, which was the release of the release date of the movie, uh, you could get information about Empire Strikes Back, but also a specially recorded audio tape of a character. And I was thinking, that's kind of wild. So uh, I looked it up, and it's on YouTube. And sure enough, Luke, Leia, Harrison Ford, Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, James Earl Jones, Anthony Daniels, they all recorded special messages. And if you picked up the phone and called, you could hear them. So I ran into Ben Kenobi and Luke Skywalker. I had myself a pretty good little operation. They wanted a ride to Alderaan, and they're willing to pay enough so I didn't have to ask any questions. Now I'm in the middle of a rebellion. I'm spending half my time dodging Imperial ships and the other half avoiding Her Holiness. Not only that, but Jabba the Hutt's got a price on my head and he's put Boba Fett on my trail. Something tells me it's not going to get any better when the Empire strikes back. 1-800-521-1980 Let's see what we get. Where the fuck you get off talking to people about me behind my back going over my head? Your fucking warrant don't ever go over my fucking head again, you motherfucker, you. So another interesting article I found that was in issue um, 33, 1980, is an article called Sci-Fi Land, Sci-Fi Scam in the log entries. So if you were to read this article in the magazine, issue 33 from 1980, you would hear a story that is basically about a guy named Barry Ira Geller who was trying to start something, a science fiction land in Colorado, and it didn't play out. His money men, the backers behind it, Sanford Entertainment Industries, turned out they didn't have, like, they didn't secure the cash from Europe like they said they did, and they basically defrauded, like, 11 people out of, like, $30,000. Lots of people's life savings went up in smoke because this, which was supposed to be the largest entertainment theme park in the country, is not going to happen. Well, I look at this picture of the supposed uh, of the plans for the proposed theme park, and it looks to me like Jack Kirby artwork. Now, Cy uh, Starlog made a little bit of a clerical error here and called him Jack Katz, not Jack Kirby. I don't really know what that's about. So when I looked it up, I wanted to be sure it was that Kirby, and I found out that yes, I did in fact go down the Starlog rabbit hole, and there was a lot more to the story that would unfold after this article was released. Basically, Science Fiction Land was the biggest shot in the dark reach for the stars plan, maybe in the history of Hollywood. Barry Ira Geller was a guy seemingly who came from nowhere who used his life savings to buy the rights to a book by Roger Zelanzi called The Lord of Light. Uh, he thought The Lord of Light was so good, and it did win a Hugo Award for Best Novel of that, like 73. He was convinced that this was such a great idea for a story about some you know, it was about astronauts who fly into the future and they go to another planet. And then as they start to get crazy and develop special powers, they take on the roles of Hindu gods and like wreak havoc upon an alien culture of like cavemen type people. And I don't know what would possess him to believe that not only was this such a blockbuster, great science fiction idea that it would best something like Star Wars to be one of the biggest hits of all time and become such a hit that he could base an entire theme park, not just a theme park, the biggest in the country around his movie, which he planned to build the theme park first in order to shoot the movie in the park by using it as a set for the space age you know, locales, and it would all be designed by Jack Kirby. Arthur C. Clarke was also somebody that he reached out to who was an advisor to the project, as well as John Chambers, the celebrated makeup artist from uh, Planet of the Apes, who you'll remember was played by John Goodman in the film Argo. But yeah, he was uh, conscripted by the CIA to help with the fake movie in rescuing the, um, you know, the American prisoners in the Canadian embassy during the Iran hostage crisis in 79. Um, but he was also involved in this, and you might be led to believe in the movie that the CIA made up a movie out of whole cloth. Well, really, they didn't. Chambers was a sort of a liaison to the, to the CIA. I guess he helped with, you know, probably doing Mission Impossible style, like disguises and fake noses for agents and all sorts of other international subterfuge. But he basically said, hey, you guys are looking for a fake movie? Well, we got one. It was a movie called Lord of Light that I was involved with that never got made. We have all these drawings and all these scripts and concepts from it. 
So basically, Barry Ira Geller's fake movie was used as the basis for the rescue mission portrayed in Ben Affleck's movie Argo, which is pretty fascinating. So that's just another example of going down the Starlog rabbit hole, guys. And trust me, there's a lot more to read about on that story of the story of science fiction land of Barry Ira Geller than I'm leading here. But I thought I'd make this video short. This was something I just wanted to put together and get out and see what the reaction was like. And if you guys enjoyed this little walk through like crazy Starlog memory lane, let me know and probably I'll do more. So guys, I'll see you next time. I've got a brand new review about either Charlie Varick or uh, Tequila Sunrise coming out next. So stay tuned. Talk to you later. Bye.